uh, born um, on this side of the tracks and uh, moved over to the other side of the tracks uh, in 1973. So I've been careful ever since. I love it over there. I, um, I'm not a uh, historian. Uh, I'm more of an interested person who collects stuff. And, uh, I probably walked every square inch of Terrafield and every time I go somewhere in Terrafield I see something that I hadn't seen before. And uh, some of what you're going to see today is uh, an attempt to, to kind of quantify that and um, my desire to sort of understand what I see. So uh, the other fascinating thing about history for me is that uh, it's a record, a record of what we did or what people came before us did. Uh, the other thing about history is that history is alive. We are all making history as we speak. And so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the present history of Terrafil and the future of Terrafil. This is my great friend, Frank Adler. Hello, thank you for coming. I see we have some ringers in the audience, so you may have some objections <laughs> raised periodically. That that's not right. I grew up there. <laughs> so that's good. We welcome it. Great. Okay, with that, we'll go ahead and start. So, um, we're going to start with the geography of Terrafil, uh, which is uh, bisected by the Talcott Mountain running north and south and the Farmington River running generally east and west. Oops. So, uh, this, this is a map oriented north-south. And uh, this is the mountain range on the true town. And this is our river, which is one of the few rivers that actually runs north, runs north through Simsbury. And then makes a uh, sharp right hand turn east west, uh, cutting through the mountain. Uh, the reason that's significant is that uh, wherever you have a break in the mountain range, it's easy to cross the mountain. So people first came to Terraville uh, to cross Talcott Mountain. Uh, John Griffin was the first guy, first white guy to come over anyway. Uh, and he started over here at St. Andrews, <coughs> in the St. Andrews area of Bloomfield, uh, by uh, uh, cutting wood for his pitchworks. And, uh, Probably a lot of you know the story that um, Manhanus had a problem with uh, uh, John Griffin and burned his pitchworks down. And in order to ransom uh, his family, in order to ransom him, they gave John Griffin the town of Simsbury. So that's how we got the town of Simsbury. Uh, the other reason that it's geographically significant is that this is where you would cross the river because the river cuts through the mountain, it's all ledge. And uh, the shallowest parts of the river uh, were in Terrapil. So before there was any before there was any bridge to Simsbury, you could actually cross the river um, in the area of the Main Street extension. And you could still cross the river in the area of the Main Street extension. You know, horse cart or on foot or on a horse and uh, so people would come over here which is Old Hartford Ave and Route 189 and they would walk over to Simsbury down Floydville Road and Walcott Road and then down what's now Route 10. Uh, the other significant factor in the geography of Terrafil is that uh, because of the uh, cut through uh, there was falls there, there was a uh, uh, rapids. And so this was a place where you could use the water power uh, during the Industrial Revolution. And, uh, you know, Terrafil uh, got its name. Uh, uh, well, Frank will tell you how it got its name, but, it, you know, the mill was located there to use the water power. So uh, it was also a good place to fish and a good place to hunt. The deer were up on the mountain. And also it had uh, the uh, 
lower areas which were good for planting. So Terrafield kind of had uh, everything going for it and eventually uh, was probably the, one of the first areas of uh, Simsbury to be settled and uh, uh, certainly a very interesting area. <coughs> Okay, let me talk about the, the names for the place. Um, they've had a separate, three different names. In the beginning, it was simply named for what it was, the falls, the waterfalls there, and people just referred to it the same way you say, well, there's the mountain, here's the falls. Um, that actually persisted for quite a while. Uh, somewhere probably before 1730, a fellow named Griswold wound up owning most of the land there, and in the first reference we found in the newspaper is about 1730 where they actually called it Griswold Village. By the 1812, the, the town officially listed it as Griswold Village. And, uh, <clears throat> but then, in uh, 1824, the uh, federal government passed a Tariff Act of 1824, which skyrocketed the import tax on manufactured woolen goods from England. <clears throat> That turned out to create a, a big difference in the, in the price, and so it became economically feasible to build a mill, water powered, to actually make woolen carpeting in the US. And there were three guys that put it together. The first fellow had a factory at the mill, at, at the, the falls, to make uh, wire brushes for combing wool. But somebody in Hartford invented a machine that did it automatically, and so put him out of business because he was doing it by hand. So but he had a factory and looking for a new product. And there was another fellow came along that was an engineer that knew how to build water-powered machinery, but he was looking for something to, to do. And finally, they found a fellow named Ellsworth who was fabulously wealthy and looking for some place to invest. So the three of them put together this, this carpet mill. And this is a picture from the top of the hill looking down towards the mill buildings it from was, the top of Elm Street, let's say, yeah, looking down. Up on the ledge, looking back down toward the mill village. And these are some of the big mill buildings scattered around here in the housing. This is Red Hill Road, which is still, uh, those buildings are still there. If, when you come down uh, Elm Street uh, today, you'll see these buildings on Red Hill Road. This, this original factory burned down, but that was the way it looked in 1838. Uh, John Barber uh, illustrated, uh, around that time, he illustrated all the towns in Connecticut, and Terrell uh, was on the list. So this came from his book called Connecticut Historical Collection. And that's a uh, black and white version of the same uh, drawing. So this is pretty much what the mill, uh, the new mill, uh, the old mill burned down in what year? 1867. So the new mill was constructed uh, shortly after that. Yeah. Actually and this building was there, that's the one that burned, and two or three of the walls were left. So rather than tear it down and start from scratch, they simply rebuilt what was there. Uh, so some of these, uh, this, this building exists today, you can see it. These buildings were uh, lost in the flood of 55. This, this is the building to tea. And this is a restaurant now, now this little. Uh, we will see that today on the walking tour. And this is another picture. This is, uh, <coughs> This picture is taken while you're standing on the railroad right away. So the railroad right away um, is, is right along here and it ran right in front of the mill. It's no longer uh, visible today, but we'll, we'll show, see some more pictures of it. This is a map from 1850. Uh, most, of the, most of the buildings are mill buildings. Uh, for the uh, tariff, you know, the tariff manufacturing company. The buildings are listed uh, and numbered here. This little island is still in the river, and it's called Griswold Island. Uh, at least on this map, it's called Griswold Island. I'm not sure that anybody in the village knows that that island is called Griswold Island. <laughs> but I found it on the map, and I said, oh, wow, the island has a name. 
and it's the only name uh, from Griswold that exists that I'm aware of. Yeah. Yeah, so, everything else became terra filled with the mill. Everything else became terra filled, but they, they listed the name of the island there. So this is the uh, factory here, which still exists. And this is uh, Mountain Road, and this is Main Street. And this is before uh, Route 189 was built. This is a little later map. It's 1869, taken uh, from a north-south uh, direction. And again, it shows a lot of the uh, structures in town. And the if you go was, back one. The mill was missing. <laughs> yeah, and the mill burned down. That's right. Right. Uh, on this map, I have a blow up. Uh, if you want to see it later on, it's over in the corner there. And you can see some very interesting things on the, the blow up of this map, including four one room schoolhouses. There's four one room schoolhouses on that map. Uh, the uh, the little uh, the little mansions on Tungsis are on that map, and uh, uh, and this uh, these structures were all lost either in the flood or in the construction of uh, Route 189. Oh, and you can see a little section of the old canal which. The river was diverted up here and then run through a canal uh, into the main structure here. The tail race, the water that came out of the tail race um, came out right here. And you can still see, we'll see it today in the back of the mill building, you'll see the arch where the water came down the canal through the building and out the back of the building. Uh, yeah. The, the factory would have been in this area, but it burned. Oh, this is um, the first railroad came to town. It was just a, uh, a stub which came over from the, uh, the canal line, which came through Simsbury. Came over in the area of the Simsbury landfill. Came through there, came over to Terrafil, and it ended um, on the uh, Main Street extension. It dead ended there. Later it was uh, brought down Main Street and on the right of way, this is Mount Road here, it was brought down Main Street in front of the factory and along what is now Route 189, that right of way was, was the railroad right of way. It was elevated, it was 15 feet above the current uh, elevation of Route 189. So when it crossed in front of the factory, it was on a trestle. So um, today, when we when we go and look at it, I'll show you basically where it was, and you'll see a picture of where it was. This is the current Cracker Barrel Pub building, and uh, and this is the same building in the fifties. Uh, when it was Farrell's Market. I'm sure some of you might remember Farrell's Market. And also, uh, Farrell's Market was here and the Avion Pub was here. Some of you may remember the Avion. <laughs> <laughs> I lived... Uh, the infamous, more than famous. The infamous, the infamous Avion. I, I lived down the street in the Avion in, in the early 70s. And uh, it was... It was always a thrill on Saturday night to uh, <laughs> see who would come rolling down the street, you know. And uh, I had more than one person wind up on my front door looking for a ride home. So. <laughs> this is uh, Elizabeth's restaurant. This is standing next in front of Elizabeth's restaurant, uh, looking south uh, to the old post office and to the building next to it. Uh, the next building burned down, and right now there's a flat roof building there <coughs> where the current uh, liquor store is in Terrafield. This is uh, the building, the second building coming up Winthrop Street on the on the right. The first building is a uh, used to be a hotel. The second building is Marsha Palmer's house, which used to hold the post office. This is again uh, Elizabeth's restaurant, uh, taken in the 40s from the uh, 
the hotel building, which is uh, now an apartment house uh, next to the um, uh, village auto. And so this over here would be what we have now, the village green. You can see the, uh, the gas pumps. There was a mobile gas station there at this time. This is the structure that burned down. This is called the Tungsis House. And this is actually on our current green. It burned down in the 30s. This is the first um, version. And then the next version will have uh, some additions on it to beautify it. Careful had a, a, a fire bug in the 30s, burned down several structures, including this one. Uh, you can see next to it some barns and... Uh, was that a hotel or a private res restaurant? That was a hotel, yeah, Thompson's House Hotel. Yeah, hotel and, a, and a fancy restaurant too, there are a lot of big shots that showed up at their restaurant. And, a, dan the, and a dance hall. Yeah, and a dance hall, after the uh, railroad came in in 1850. So Mark Twain had been there, and a couple of big, Grover Cleveland was there, and a few other big wigs. It was, it was the any, place to go. Any part of that survived now? Nope. No, no, no it's all back, No. We found a big stone in the back. We thought it might have been a step or something from right. the house. A piece of cut stone. <laughs> and this is a the same Francis house that in front of the front. So this is actually the uh, this is actually the village auto, uh, which is uh, Katie Corner across from um, the correct Borough pub. And this is actually on the green uh, corner of uh, Winthrop mm -hmm. and Maine. It's the same one you saw in the picture with the snow on the ground and the pumps and the big uh, mobile sign. So we had, at one time, we had two, two gas stations. We had three hotels. We had the Tungsis House and uh, the Worcester House and one more. I, I don't remember the name. Thurston? Uh, yeah, Thurston, yeah. And we had three, three package stores when I was young. Two, two or three pubs. Turfville was a rollicking place in the old days. When other places were dry, Turfville was wet. <laughs> so this is the Mitchelson house. It's on uh, Elm and... Um, Elman Church, and the Mitchelsons owned most of the town at one time, including the Heights, uh, including uh, Governor's Bridge. Um, quite a, they owned quite a bit of town. Ariel Mitchelson was the first tobacco farmer to, to experiment with tenting back in the 1890s, and it was a fantastic success. Um, but he's the one that proved it. None of the other farmers were willing to gamble because it might not work. They could just go do the broadleaf and let it go with that. <laughs> but he had a home run with this one. Was, um, was, was, the, was, the, uh, was it in Terrafield? Yeah. Yes, it up in the Heights. Up in the Heights, yeah. yeah. Fields, one and two. So this house still exists. It doesn't look quite the same as it did. <laughs> this is uh, Elm and uh, Church. <clears throat> this is also uh, Church Street going uh, towards the mountain. This was the young undertaker's house, the Pease residence. We, we'll see that one today. You can't see this picture very well, but uh, we'll see the house today. This is on Center Street, close to Elm Street. This, oh, I'm sorry, sorry back up. Uh, this house exists today. You'll see it. It hasn't changed much. It is a uh, uh, parking house. <coughs> This is the poor house. When you go down Elm Street, it's near the bottom on the right. And one more. Coming up Elm Street on the left, this is what it looks like today. It's an apartment house. Now it was the poor house when. This is uh, an example of a boarding house. There were a lot of single guys in Terrafield, either working at the mill or working um, uh, for. Um, the kitchens, builders, building uh, stone structures, or working on tobacco. Uh, so there were uh, 
single guy boarding houses. I'm not exactly sure where this was, but I thought it was an interesting picture. We have uh, St. Bernard's, which uh, this is the Victorian uh, St. Bernard's, and the current St. Bernard's has aluminum siding on it, so it doesn't quite look as fancy as this one. And this is the Episcopal Church. Probably the, uh, probably the only brownstone building around that was not built by the Ketchens. <laughs> I'm not sure why. I'm sure there's a story associated with that. But the Ketchens built everything around except for this. And this is a church that no longer exists except uh, it's a Baptist church. It's on Church Street. And uh, this part of it exists, which is probably the uh, parish house or the parson's house. And this is a this structure is a private re residence. We'll see that today. Now this was the Griswold School. It was also called uh, at one point it was called Terrafield School. So that's the only other name um, that I ever heard associated with Griswold. And the location of this was Ch Church Street in uh, Winthrop, next door to the current firehouse. This structure was actually taken down uh, in the 20s when it uh, was out of date. And then they built the uh, what's currently the Terrafield Elementary School. It wasn't taken down in the 20s, because we used to play in that in the 40s. I used to love oh, really? I lived right yeah. next to it. Oh, OK. I oh, lived between I that and the St. Bernard's. Oh, OK. So it was taken down rather than burned down. That's correct. Yeah. <laughs> The this is one of those one-room houses, early uh, 40s, and uh, I'm not sure which one this was. As I say, there were at least four of them. And uh, what was interesting about this was uh, apparently the way photographers work today. You know, they come to your school, they take pictures of your kids, and then they sell you the pictures. Well, they were doing that then, but the problem was nobody had any money. So the photographer wrote on the back, poor like hell, not a dollar in the neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> Another, uh, oh, this is actually the, the Griswold School. Was it called the Terrible School or the Griswold School? Or what was it called when you knew it? I'm not sure. Uh, well, my dad was a principal there for three years before the new school was uh, built, 1925. And your dad was? The principal of the terrible And his name? Giles Desmond. Giles Desmond. From 22 so to 56. He was oh, so he started here. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Well, what's the date? It's hard to read. Okay. The date on the bottom. 1920. It says 1923, Terrible yeah. School. <laughs> I like the dress. Mm -hmm. So this was the, the school. Uh, this is school. The current, uh, well, the first version of Terrafield School, it's had two editions since then. Uh, and this is Connie Swingle's uh, class at the front. <laughs> we'll see this structure today. It won't look quite the same as it did, but this is on uh, Main Street, uh, just before the Main Street extension. It's called the Penny's Pub. And uh, we still have Penny's living in, in town. Mr. Finney uh, remembers his uncle jumping through the window when the feds came to raid it. <laughs> <laughs> Terrafield was a hopping place. This is uh, the Avion, and um, it was also called Nichols, uh, Nichols Bar and Grill, I believe. This was a, on a, a day when they had a chimney fire, and this is taken. From the other angle, you can see the name Nichols Bar and also the Avian. Eddie, Nich Eddie Nichols lived uh, in the what, what was the most recent post office building. Eddie was our neighbor for years and years, and his dad had that pub. The Bartlett Tower, the first version of the, uh, the first terrible version of the tower, there was a Bartlett Tower in Avon. This was the first terrible version of the Bartlett Tower. And then there's another one. And this was the later version of it. When uh, Antoinette Eno had, her, had bought it and used it as a summer home, this tower was burned uh, in the 30s. Summer home six. 
1936. 36, yeah, right. 36. Yeah. This is, uh, this is uh, Church Street Extension. This is the Undertaker's house. And this is the tower. Looking towards the mountain. There were two entrances to that tower. One go, winds up from this street, the other one goes off the mountain road. Yes. And the gates and things are still there. Yes. But and we will, uh, today we'll, we'll uh, come down here and see the old pillars that said uh, Laurel Hill, that still say Laurel Hill on them. And this is where uh, Justin Farrell has done a Boy Scout project to improve that entrance. So uh, this is the, as you mentioned, the second entrance to uh, the tower was on Mountain Road, and this is the tower in the background to Mountain Road. This is some advertising uh, to go and see the tower. What was the, pur what was the purpose of the tower? It was, uh, it was an observation tower. You paid money to go up and look around. You can see a lot of yeah. them up there. Yeah. But they did dancing and there was a bowling alley and oh. yeah, it was, uh, all kinds of things. They had a telescope up there. Well, it was something to do on a Sunday afternoon was to walk up to the tower with the family and enjoy the day. Yeah. You could actually buy a train ticket in Hartford or the Baby and they would ride to Tariffville and they'd meet you with a wagon. And the horse drawn wagon would take you all the way up to the top of the hill. And if you walked that trail, you'd be impressed at how big and strong those horses had to be. It's a very steep climb. But the, the stone walls are still there to hold the road together. Mark Twain, Mary <laughs> Beecher Stowe, and Whittier. Yeah, um, there are a number of people that were up there at one time or another. Yeah. This is uh, the remains of the tower, just a chimney left. And this was taken from the ins uh, a picture taken from the inside of the tower that <coughs> deteriorated. So when the railroad came to town, it first uh, came over uh, from um, uh, from the canal line. You can't really see it on this oh, map. You can, see the, you can see this part. Yeah. That's where they had to raise it up to get the bed. But there was a bridge across there and it went over to where the uh, town farm dairy is, past the landfill. And then um, uh, when um, the railroad was looking for an east east-west connection, uh, you know, they had the northwest, north-south connection from New Haven, Hartford, Springfield. But when they were looking for an east-west connection, they came through Terraville uh, because that was the easiest place, to, easiest place to cross the mountain. So uh, they, re, they brought it down, uh, like I say, the Route 189 right away, um, and it was elevated. And then it came around behind the Governor's Bridge and went down and joined uh, the canal line around, um, around the uh, Hoskins Road area. And um, right here behind the Governor's Bridge was where the famous uh, train wreck happened. And then later on, there was a spur uh, going north to uh, uh, to Westfield, I guess, or Springfield, and um, you can still see the bridge supports in the river where that uh, trestle was. And um, if you go one more, this is on the Main Street extension. If you go back one, right here. The next slide shows that section. Looking, looking west. So that's looking west from the Main Street extension. So the the railroad actually ran down the the Main Street extension, right, away. and then it headed north uh, to uh, Westfield and south, uh, south and west over to Simsbury. This is where the train crossed in front of the mill building on Main Street on an elevated trestle. So when this trestle was, well, after the 55 flood, uh, this trestle was uh, removed and uh, the route 
189 right away was blasted to lower the right away 15 feet. So now Route 189 crosses that road level in front of the, uh, in front of the building. This is another angle looking north. This is the wreck behind the building. This led to the first 911 call in America. The fellow who operated the Terrible's uh, train station heard the crash, and he sent a telegram into downtown Hartford that said, send a doctor, because we got you know, some medical problems. So they put together a train, and the fellow at the, at the uh, train station picked up his phone, and the only people in town at that time that had a phone, 1878, were the doctors. So he put out the call, and the doctors all went to the railroad station, and everybody piled on, and they came out to try to deal with the, the people that were there. There's a video um, that on SCTV, if you look on Simsbury Community Television, of a high school kid uh, from Simsbury High who put together a documentary on that train wreck, and it's really quite spectacular. This is a little uh, write-up, which I actually included in your, in your packet. This is uh, the, uh, the railroad headed north. This, we're standing on the uh, Main Street extension. And we'll be able to see these, these uh, bridge um, supports. They still exist. The, truss, the trestle itself is gone. There they are. This is a picture taken from Terrafield Park as it exists today. Compliments of Wanda. <laughs> is there anything left of the bridge where the actual train wreck occurred? I know that was a different part yes, of the river. The abutments is on the Carapil <laughs> side. Oh, yeah? It's still there. You yeah, can walk the there's a path along the river and you can walk along and all of a sudden you see this built up stone thing. It's a vertical abutment, but then extended. Now that the t leaves are off the trees, you may or may not be able to see the other side, but it's not at the edge of the river because the land on that side of the river is very low. So they built a hump. Okay, all the way in, and there is an abutment further in. So the, the bridge was actually much longer than the width of the river. Is that kind of where the uh, condos are? Kind of in the yeah, middle? Look right below that. Yeah, a little bit north of that. Uh, well, well, like where the, the tree, the Bartlett tree guys are. Right? Oh, okay. okay. So you can so take the path to the condos to the river yeah. and then go right along there. Yeah. yeah. And go or, see it. I, I, dis I discovered the... Uh, the the first time I saw them was when I was in a canoe and I almost ran into these pil uh, posts in the river. The, the original um, posts that held the bridge up are still in the river under, under the water line. So when the river um, level is low, you run into those little posts with your canoe if you're not careful. Mm -hmm. And then I look up and I see the bridge abutment, the stone uh, bridge abutment uh, right there. Yeah. I forgot what caused the train wreck. They are still arguing. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> At that time, um, there were all kinds of wheeling and dealing going on with the railroad industry. And what would happen is a group of investors would put together a company to build a railroad, and they would sell shares. And then they would hire a company to actually build the railroad. Well, they owned the company that built the railroad, and they fudged the bidding documents so that they could get paid a huge amount of money, more than what it would actually cost. Mm -hmm. And so they would be pocketing money from their investors by selling them the, the, the actual construction contract. So they were making money illegally that way. But then they got even greedier, and so they would cut corners. And so the bridge went down because the train was going over it. It was no big deal. It just collapsed. <coughs> so almost certainly the, the beams were not the right size, or they weren't put together correctly. Somebody made some some whatever. But when they tried to do an investigation to figure out who to blame them on and who to sue, they couldn't find any smoking guns, so they kind of gave it up. So uh, I'm going to take the uh, other side of the equation and say that it was uh, this. Frank's got one side, I got the other side. The other side is that uh, the, uh, the train derailed for whatever reason and went through the side of the bridge. Uh, and the reason that I take that point of view is because when they rebuilt the bridge, 
They built it on the same design, except they added bumpers. So that if your train derails, you won't go out, you just go off. So we're still arguing. One of the questions is to check the, the uh, film, the documentary that the high school kids made, and we were sort of the sponsor of that. It goes into that whole question, why? And there are two or three theories. It's really, it's really interesting to see. And also to see the uh, amount of damages that were paid. And by today's dollars, it would be almost meaningless. Yeah. People kind of accepted, well, okay, 10 or 11 people died, and life goes on. You know? so it, it, it's, it's, it's well worth seeing if you, if you haven't seen it yet. Yeah. When, they, when they rebuilt the bridge, they didn't go across the river the same place. They turned to the left, and the bridge, when I was growing up, you could see is halfway down the hill from Terrafo there where the road turns. The bridge was right out there. It wasn't where that original one was. Mm -hmm. So, like I say, we're still arguing. <laughs> <laughs> what caused the flood? Was it a spring thaw or a heavy rain? Or? 55? Well, yeah, there was there was a 55 flood, which was basically uh, the same thing we had last yeah. year, yeah. a hurricane. Yeah. yeah. A tremendous amount of rain wiped out all of downtown Winston. 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 You drive through Winston, there's nothing on the left. It's all on the right. It's all washed away. The whole street washed away. And it Terrible became an island. You could not get into Terrible from any direction except by helicopter. And it happened in 36 also. We have a couple pictures of that. So this is right at the Main Street extension, the road to. Uh, uh, old, what is now uh, Old Hartford Avenue and East Grand, looking across to what is uh, Old Hartford Avenue and East Grand. And the flood of 55 just left over the edge of that at about midnight. Yeah. They did yeah. about two inches over that. The Army engineers afterwards said it wasn't safe, but it did not get taken away like the one. Yeah, yeah it didn't break on its own, but they took it down because they didn't think they could fix it. <clears throat> so we will come to this location today. Uh, we'll stand right in this area. You can still see some of the stone walls. Um, uh, over here is where you'll see those uh, bridge uh, supports. And down, down the hill towards the river, you'll see a section of the old canal, uh, which fed the, uh, the mill. Do you know where the, in the history of Sinsbury, they talk about the original building for the Trinity of Christian <laughs> Church was eminent domain for the railroad to come through. I can't picture just where right. that was. It was between the uh, Elizabeth's restaurant and the Cracker Barrel pub and slightly okay. uh, slightly towards the rear. Okay. Right on the right away. Yeah. So they had That's to remove it. Yeah. What was here? Did you were you the old, uh, well it was actually a Methodist church oh, okay. which the Episcopals bought. Yeah. This the uh, uh, same same bridge Oh, and you can see the uh, the railroad in the, uh, coming out of Terrible Park. And this is before they did the stone wall. Yeah, before the stone wall, that's right. And what's the building on the right in the back? Uh, this is the bridge. That's not a building in the back? Uh, no, this is the bridge. Over here is, uh, these are all trees. And this is the uh, the uh, railroad going to uh, East Grand <coughs> Point North. <coughs> This is that same bridge, uh, taken from what would now be the 189 bridge. I'm not sure what, how they actually got this picture, because it looks like they're standing in the middle of the river. Yeah. But somehow or another, they did. Now this bridge is uh, on Tonks's. What? What? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This was. Uh, this is East Granby. This is. This is where the river goes down into the gorge where the kayak races are. And this was, um, um, this bridge was washed out in 55. And this, this is what it looked like before it became an iron bridge. It was a, uh, a wooden bridge. That looks scary. <laughs> <laughs> scary. Yeah. That's real safe. <laughs> <laughs> So Terrapil had a variety of industries, including tobacco, quarrying, uh, harvesting ice, and go back one, please. And 
stone masonry, no, right? Stone. Okay. So this is, uh, I can quote it, you can't really read them, but I just wanted you to see that there were a couple of articles from 1901, 1904, having to do with um, raising tobacco and trying out raising tobacco under shade. So that happened in Terrapil. I think it may have happened some other places too, but it was successful in Terrapil. And you can actually Google a couple of articles uh, written by the Hartford Current. I think I found four, four or five of them. And um, uh, if you have pretty good eyesight, you can see something about, uh, uh, let's see, Secretary Wilson saying that, uh, Secretary Wilson tells of success at Terrafil. So this was kind of a big deal to try to uh, raise tobacco on the clock. It was uh, perfected in Terrafil and became commercially viable. I don't think we were the only place to try it out, but we were the first place that I'm aware of that was successful at it. And uh, to the point where Ketchin and Hayes built a, uh, a warehouse to store the tobacco, which later warehouse was uh, converted to our current firehouse. That is, one, that is a great picture. I've never seen that one. Yeah. Where, where did you get it? At? Source unknown. My <laughs> wife collects pictures. Okay. <laughs> she doesn't know where she got it. But you have it in your... In your Archive, of your personal archive? Yeah, well, yeah, but we don't know where we got it. Where did we get it? What? Where did we get this picture? I don't know. Don't collect <laughs> it ever. Don't ask questions. We don't know where we got it. But um, Mary Jane, uh, I have really enjoyed reading your articles about the catches. Oh, I mean, that's thank you. fantastic. Yeah, thank you. I wish I had that one to publish when I was writing those articles. What we're speaking of here is Mary Jane Springman is a trustee of our library here, the Free Library, and writes a quarterly um, newsletter that is quite educational. And if you become a member of the library, you can um, get it delivered to your home quarterly. Just a, just a little. <laughs> now, this fellow Ketchin was uh, quite, uh, he was quite a businessman. He was smart as anything. And um, one of the things he did was uh, he hired, you know, like I say, the, the Ketchins built most of the brownstone buildings in Simsbury, Ensign Bickford, Avon, and so they needed a lot of guys. So they would train their, train their guys to build, and then, then uh, when winter came, they didn't have work for them, they would all disappear, and then the next year they'd have to go try to find new guys. So Ketchin had the idea of, of uh, going in the tobacco business and giving his men work in the wintertime, um, you know, packing tobacco. So he could keep his men busy all year round. I learned that from reading Mary Jane's articles. <laughs> and, uh, and so he combined with Hayes, you know. And uh, Hayes was, uh, he was a descendant of the Mitchelsons. So the Mitchelsons and the Hayes were tobacco growers, and they combined, and... Uh, they had quite a quite a business. What looks like windows on? Go back. Yeah, oh. what, what are those? Is that overhead? That light? looks like solar <laughs> panels. <laughs> this is uh, over, <laughs> overhead light. So this would have been uh, natural lighting. Yeah, yeah, natural lighting. That's so where they sorted. They sorted and back. And sometimes and rolled cigars too. Yeah. I think. Mm -hmm. Under yeah. natural light. And what direction would that face? The uh, we'll see this building today. Uh, the front door faces uh, east. Yeah. And uh, the. Huh? Oh, you say that? So it is south with the windows. The windows are westerly. Westerly. Southwest. Yeah. Southwest. Yeah. This, yeah. They would roll tobacco. Roll tobacco in the building? Yeah, they sorted. There was a very natural slide for kids to go down if no one was looking. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we also have here today Mr. Schoenhardt, uh, who did a fabulous job converting 
uh, designing the conversion of this building to firehouse. The architecture is phenomenal. <laughs> Thank you very much. Wonderful addition. This is uh, that just for your benefit. That's the Episcopal Church. So this is uh, this would have been up in the Heights, and this is not an unusual site for Connecticut. But you don't think of it being in Fairfield. Uh, people who live. Oh, are we switching? I get. What you want, Mike? I get one time. <laughs> I have a van, so I can take six people in the carpool. Uh, so anyway, this is a pretty common site for Connecticut. You don't think of it as being in Therapol, but it was. In fact, people who have who garden up in the Heights tell me sometimes tobacco comes up when they're gardening, doing gardening. And in my backyard on Red Hill Road, when we were removing some trees and digging everything up, it smelled like tobacco. So uh, quite a bit of tobacco. And, there were 12 separate fields. Two of them were either between the, the road and the river. Yeah. It was 11 and 12 or down yeah. where the, the governor's bridge, governor's yeah. bridge yeah. is yeah. now. Yeah. And another picture of the high. And the Now here's an interesting thing. Uh, this, is, uh, <laughs> this is a quarry, and this is uh, the railroad on the Route 189 right away. And uh, this is the Farmington River, and that's the, the Tungsis Bridge to East Granby. Uh, when I looked uh, on the map to see uh, who owned this property, it was Balfe. And of course, the Balfe quarries are kind of famous. I don't know if it was Balfe that ran this quarry, but uh, when you're driving down 189, you see that big cliff up there? Yeah. That, that, that was a quarry. And um, uh, the color of that stone, you'll see it in certain houses in Simsbury. You know, most, most, of the, most of the stone buildings around here are, are redstone. But there are a few that are this gorgeous kind of a goldish, goldish stone. And that's... It's the basalt. The basalt. That's right. The basalt. The crap rock. That's the color of that. That's the color of that uh, area, and you'll see it in a few of the houses around town. So I'm assuming that's where that stone came from. And of course, being right on the railroad, they could have shipped that stone a lot of different places. There's not much that exists of that except some uh, some concrete uh, uh, building foundations. Oops. <laughs> And this is Ketchum and Sons contractors. They dug, dug most of the foundations in Terrafield. Um, and as I say, they, they were quite successful builders. You know. So they, they built the Methodist church. They built the Methodist, or, and, Methodist and church. And what is now Webster Bank. That's the Webster Bank. House and, and all of Ensign Bickford's stone. All of Ensign Bickford? Right. The, the current town yeah. hall? The, yes, right. <laughs> Absolutely. The Central Grammar School? Yeah. And on and on. I wanted to ask you about the lace making industry that was uh, noted in Terrafell. I thought that's <coughs> where they got the, the name, uh, you know. Oh, no. no from it wasn't a lace yes, company yes, until yes. like the 1890s. And it was actually a British company that came over and built a factory here to make lace. And they were in business like until 1930 or 31, something like that. When the fellow, it eventually was bought by somebody who lived here whose name escapes me. Uh, but he kept it going, but it was not very profitable. And when he died, the, the, uh, the trustees that took over managing his will just said, done. I, I had heard at one time that uh, many Irish uh, immigrants worked in the lace mm -hmm. making and they're buried in St. In St. Bernard's. Oh, that's true. But if you go back to the beginning, in 1825, yeah. when they built the first mill, they knew how to spin, they knew how to comb yarn with water power. They knew how to spin it into yarn with water power. They had no idea how to build a machine that would weave it. <coughs> so they brought Scottish 
weavers who used to weave in their homes on, on piecework kind of thing. And they brought a bunch of them over and built some housing and set up these Scottish workers just in a big room with hand looms. And so they were making the carpets. And if you go into the old part of the, of the cemetery, you'll find a couple of tombstones that say so-and-so from Paisley, Scotland. And they would have been dying in the 1830s and 1840s after working in the mill for a long time. So it was always a, a constant turnover of, of immigrants basically coming to work for all the various things all the way through, even, you know, all the carpets, all the mills, all the whatever. So. And there, the Scottish uh, immigrants, their, their church was Old St. Andrews in Bloomfield. That was their church. And then... And then eventually there were more people on this side of the mountain than on the other side, and they built uh, uh, the Episcopal Church in Terrafield to, to serve these, basically the Scottish in immigrants. Yeah. But it started as a branch of the Scotland. Yeah, it was a mission but, church. But it was kind of a giant yeah. branch. <laughs> yeah, it was a mission church that outgrew the main church. Mm -hmm. Well, I this saw is this a, picture in the History of Sensory book. I can't picture where this was. Was it on the river itself? That's what it looks like to me. Uh, no, it, it looks like uh, below the governor's bridge where uh, people used to swim. Oh, yeah, for Simon Brook comes in. Uh, no, uh, north of that, uh, closer to where the um, train wreck was, a little further north of that. Oh, okay. Or a little further south of that. So, I'm pretty sure that I'm pretty sure that this okay, coming up here Jeff is Terrafield Road. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's the one that we published in the, the picture book, uh -huh. that was donated by Jackson Eno, and he um, identifies that as on Mrs. Wood's property in the, the pond there. Oh, you know what's called Belden Pond. Now oh, really? Right. Oh, so that's not a terrible picture. I don't think so. If it's the same picture, I'm not sure. I mean, mm. you know, but if it's the same one as in the book. Yeah. Well, um, source is unknown, and I'm just guessing, so you probably know better than I do. Well, I don't know if that's the same picture, but you know, this gentleman said something about it as the picture in the book. So. I'm sure they harvested ice everywhere. So they did. I, including they did. the river. So. There was a natural beach just opposite where uh, Salmon Brook comes in. Yes, it still is. Yeah. There. And still is, yeah. So this is 1955. And most of the most of the mill structures were wiped out except for the main structure. Yeah, you know, the one in the back here is already gone. Yeah. Wow. It, this one went next. It lasted till 10 minutes after 10. Tony Bogus that ran the Gulf gas station had a big spotlight, but they're putting it out and watching it up the windows. Uh, oh. Ten after ten, he put it out there, and there was nothing. Mm. Wow. wow. <clears throat> this is uh, down further down the river at the uh, the power generating station in East Grand. Yeah, Spoonville Dam. Spoonville Dam. You can see this is a pipe coming from the dam, going into the powerhouse that carried the water from up high behind the dam. This is that mm. Tunxis uh, bridge again, and this is 1936, another flood. And this is that same bridge, uh, no, I'm sorry, this is the bridge you spoke of, Mr. Desmond, uh, at the Main Street extension, which uh, survived the flood, uh, but was later taken down as deemed to be unsafe. This is taken from behind the mill, and um, this is the tail race where the water used to run through the mill from out the bottom. And this is the parking lot. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Under we're gonna, this is where water. we're going to park today. <laughs> <laughs> and this is uh, the Tungsis Bridge while it was alive, and this is the Tungsis Bridge in its demise. That's a Harper current one. About 12 of us walked across that bridge about half an hour before that. They had asked for volunteers to go down and take equipment out of the substation of it was Helco then. And by the time we came back, by the time we got there, they said, no, it's too dangerous. And we came back. It was already flowing over the bridge. And you had to walk on the lee side, or it would knock your feet out. From, uh -huh. And half an hour after that, 
we turned around, I, I saw the last beam go into the water, just in the time I was turning around. Mm -hmm. This is again taken uh, at the power generating station down uh, in East Granby. And this uh, dam has since been removed this, this <laughs> summer. This dam was, was actually removed. And uh, it was, I think, a $3 million project, Wanda, some big number. I mean, 700000 Oh, 700,000? <laughs> well, you know, prices have dropped recently. <laughs> so this is uh, taking down the, uh, taking down the, um, uh, the railroad trestle in front of the mill. This is after 1955, we took it down. And this is removing the trestle down in Fairfield Park and preparations for building the Route 189 bridge. They eliminated two bridges and built one. This is a section of the canal. Uh, it was a, a stone, um, had stone walls making a canal. You, we, we'll be able to see part of that today. So we had mm -hmm. floods, we had fires, and this is the mill. Go ahead. This is the building that's still there now. You can see this wall was left, that front wall was left, part of the foundation is still there, the roof is gone. But rather than tear it down and start over, they simply rebuilt all of this wall and all of the whole roof section in the next year, 1868. What's interesting is in order to put the roof together, they're made out of these massive chestnut beams. They're heavy to lift. So what they did is they built a wheel inside the first train. Once, once they got the first A up there, they put in a wheel that they could then use with a black pulley to hoist up the rest of the beam. But kind of like building a boat in your garage and not thinking about the size of the door. When they were all done, there was no way to get the wheel out. So it's still there. When Stephen Stang first bought the mill, we went through it with him and the wheel was still mounted. But since then, he's put all kinds of air conditioning ducts and other kinds of things. So they had to take it down. But it's still there. It just leaned it against the side wall. It's about 10 feet in diameter and big, massive, massive contraption. So this is the Bartlett Tower. Excuse me. Prior to the experiment. 1936. And that's the remains of the campus. Which you can still see today. We can back up there. This is... Uh, 41 Main Street, the sister building that burned. And this would be down below a flat, flat roof building where the current uh, liquor store is. This is that same building from the side. And there's apparently a tavern there too, which uh, I don't know if it was there when you were in town. Uh, Al's Tavern, I, I had never seen that one. <coughs> so, Terrafield today. Terrafield. Um, resides at the happy confluence of four areas of natural, national recognition. The National Register, the Wild and Scenic Farmington River, the New England National Scenic Trail, and the East Coast Greenway. So this is a little map I did to illustrate that point. This purple line is the uh, representative of the Metacomet Trail, which is now the New England National Scenic Trail. Very significant, um, hit, um, federally protected trail. Of course, the blue is the river. The Farmington River in the upper areas was um, federally protected, designated wild and scenic, and now it's being studied in the lower areas for federal protection. I don't know how far we are along on that. Uh, bills are in Congress since last April, and there they sit. <laughs> and, uh, so we'll, we'll hope for passage when Congress gets rolling again. We are also on the East Coast Greenway. This uh, orange line represents the uh, East Coast Greenway. The, the East Coast Greenway is the main to Florida bicycle path. It's also a multi-use path. And uh, Terraville and Simsbury are on that route. We would like to get it off the road um, at some point, and there are, the town has plans to bring it through uh, 
uh, Curtis Park and behind the Governor's Bridge and into Terrafield Park and back over to Bloomfield to the uh, Griffin Line. Hopefully that someday that'll be built. But right now we have a steady stream of bicyclists through bicyclists through Terrafield. Day and night, Monday through Sunday, all the time the bicycles are coming through town because it's the easiest place to cross the mountain. Again. And we've been on the National Register for quite some time. Thank you, Anita Mielert. Uh, since 1993, uh, the 70 or 90 structures in town that are on the National Register. I have a whole book in the back which lists all the structures that are on the National Register. So, uh, Terrafil is kind of unique. I, I'm not sure that I know of another place that has four areas of national recognition. We thought that that should be marked on the map. So we thought Terrafil Green would be a good place to do it. And that's where we built our gazebo as the crossroads for those four areas of national recognition. If you could go to those websites, just quickly. Where is the, the gazebo? Uh, where, oops, okay. go back. Uh, right there on Main Street, we'll see that uh, across from Elizabeth's restaurant. So we'll go to the, uh, yeah, go to the, uh, uh, so this is the uh, National Register website. As I say, there's 70 to 90 structures in town. Then this is the uh, website for the Lower Farms and River and Sam Brook Wild and Scenic Study. The New England National Scenic Trail is the Metacomet, Monadnock, Matabesic Trail System. They used to call it the Triple M System or the Metacomet Trail. And now the official name is the New England Trail, National Scenic Trail. And, what else we got? Okay. and of course, we're on the East Coast Greenway. And uh, Steve, you want to say something about that? <laughs> I just, I just wish it'd get done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's uh, 2,500 miles or 3,000 miles long, and they do a little section of it here and a little section of it there, and. Uh, yeah. We're fortunate to have a big section here in Simsbury, and we would like that to be brought over to Terrafield. Looking forward to that happening one day. I would like to ask you if you know what they're doing uh, when they cut down all the trees, uh, like on 189 above the river, <coughs> and uh, and it's flat there. And it, uh, what what is that all about? They've uh, upgraded the uh, electrical grid. You know, you know how our power is is pretty reliable, but not always. Right. So they've upgraded oh, the power system. That, that's going to go, if it, if it continues, it will go all the way. It's a huge uh, clear-cutting of property that's been closed. Um, quite fine endeavor. On the other side of town, we'll let the Metacomet uh, side uh, all the way. And prior to erecting the, they, you know, they've started to erect towers and bring in new lines and stuff. Prior to doing that, they had, they were months uh, doing an arche archaeological digs and uh, assessing the uh, archaeological significance of wherever they were going to put a, uh, you know, a tower. They had to assess that they weren't um, ruining something which had a lot of architectural, or rather, uh, archaeological significance. So uh, they had uh, the University of Massachusetts there um, all summer uh, doing yeah. that. And uh, they didn't really want to say too much about what they were doing because they didn't really want anybody coming around, you know. But uh, they found a lot of stuff. Was there evidence of any Indian activity prior to when we settled this area, Terrell area? Oh, yeah. As far as our yeah, area? it's, it, it's in everywhere. Mark Banks did his PhD by digging on the 
the Bloomfield side of 189, away from the river. Yeah. And he found all kinds of, 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 of fire pits and, wow. and, and all kinds of things. Very expensive. It, it's on CLMP land. Yeah, it's, we're it's in the corridor of that path. He took us back there this spring, but since he had done it when it was open fields, the cows went away and the, nobody oh. mowed the lawn anymore. It's all woods. So we were really bushwhacking through some tough stuff yeah. trying to remember where we were. Yeah, the, uh, the prehistoric um, activity in, in the Terrafield area and Simsbury is uh, very significant and uh, uh, everywhere. Absolutely everywhere. Absolutely everywhere. See on the map, Pickerel Cove, does it mean what you would guess it means? Pickerel still Cove? a good place to catch pickerel. Yeah. I'm sorry? It's still a good place to catch pickerel. Really? Yeah. I thought there was a dam that... Uh, no, that was just the meander of the river. If you look at a map of the river, you'll see all these places where the river isn't anymore, but there's obviously a bend. Yeah. The river is constantly changing its path, and every now and then it, it crosses over and leaves something abandoned. And typically, it's a semicircle, or a piece of it. That's what Pickle Cove was. But now that it's isolated, there's no current in there. And apparently, pickles don't like current, so they, they hide in there. Uh -huh. Yep, and bass. Pickle and bass. Yeah, we go in with our canoe. It's gorgeous in there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, the access is from um, Terrafield Park. Park. Mm -hmm. uh, Main Street. Well, of course, right. you got to have a canoe. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> uh, if you want to access from the other side, it's from the airport. It, if you if you walk on the uh, Simsbury Airport grounds mm -hmm. to the far corner and look over, it's a 50 foot drop, but that's where Pickle Cove is. Um, yeah. I just want to mention the 38 hurricane and the impact that had in starting the Avon Volunteer Fire, Avon, <laughs> um, Terrible. Terrible Fire Department, because the history of Simsbury doesn't talk about it, but uh, there were three tobacco barns up at the point there. And they were in the initial firing stage at the, at the beginning of the tobacco, and mm -hmm. after the eye went over our village, um, the wind shifted. People didn't understand the eye of a hurricane, and the wind shifted 180 degrees. Two of the roofs caved in, two of the three barns, and the only fire engine in the Farmington Valley was Ensign Bickford. The roads were flooded, the phone lines were down, so you just watch. I was only five years old, but you don't forget something like that. And after that, Art Hayes organized, I can't remember the other names, but he organized the people, and that's when the water went in, the sewers went in, and they bought a fire. You saw that fire engine uh, downtown. The first place it was housed was just as you start down Elm Street on the left. The, that was an old tobacco warehouse too, but the first place they housed that uh, was in the bottom of that one. And then they moved it to the tobacco warehouse when they fixed that up. And where were the barns that burned? Right up at the point where, if, uh, as, you, as you go down. Uh, the Winthrop there, and Elm? Yep, there were three. Winthrop and Elm. The houses weren't there then. There were three barns, and but one of them didn't burn. Two of the three burned, and they burned completely. So uh, that must be when they built the uh, stone tobacco warehouse that was uh, not not uh, flammable. Yeah, no. you mean the one that's a firehouse now? Yeah. No, that was built way before. Oh, it was. That was there before I was born. I don't know just when. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I'm awfully sorry that Barbara um, Hayes, Hayes yeah. Smith did not show up today. I, I took her to lunch on Thursday. Did you know Barbara uh, Hayes, Art, Arthur J. Hayes' daughter? daughter yeah. Yeah. His son was Dusty, and Barbara yeah. also played the organ at St. Bernard's. Right. Yeah. Anyway, she could tell us all about that because she yeah. drove me over there and showed me uh, this and that, and, and I was surprised to hear that that tobacco warehouse where the fire department started, that first building, which is, uh, shall I say, west of the Mitchelson house where Dr. Sullivan lived and, and Arthur Hayes lived, yeah. that was the first kitchen tobacco warehouse oh, and the first yeah. where the fire, play, uh, fire engine first was, do you agree? 
Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. They, <laughs> they made three houses eventually, or three residences, out of what had been that uh, barn. But it was in the part that opened up on Elm Street. Where That's the barn, right? That, that was original. Yeah, no, I, don't, I don't remember it as the barn by the okay. time uh, I was, it was born. Okay, that, that was, that that was a, a big deal to me on Thursday when she yeah. told me about that. <laughs> So uh, this is our uh, village green, this is our gazebo, and the sidewalks, uh, the brick walks just within the summer. We have to do the planting in the spring and the new lamp posts. Uh, this is the actual gazebo, courtesy again of Sean Hart. <laughs> This is some of the uh, details in the cutouts representing um, the bicycle represents the East Coast Greenway, the canoe represents the Wild and Scenic Farmington River, the foliage represents the Metacomet National, uh, National Scenic Trail, and uh, we are in an historic looking gazebo, if you could back up one. Also, the, uh, the railings for the gazebo are made to represent canoe paddles, so you'll, you'll see that today. And then the style, obviously, is a historic looking style. <coughs> so what's the future of Terrapo? We see that we should be building on our natural assets, our natural resources, and um, certainly recreation and uh, historic activities, cultural events, and uh, businesses that would support that type of activity. And let's see what else we got here. Here's an old picture of people having fun on the river. And I have a, a hundred more uh, having fun pictures, but due to technical difficulties, I don't have any of them here. So, <laughs> Well, this is swimming on, on the river some more. Fun activity. Uh, this is the uh, Frank. You want to stay with this one? Yeah, this is a, a diagram of the race course. Um, this is the big picture showing the, the Spoonville Bridge now on 187, and the mill down in here, and the river coming through. The race course is in the center, so we blew it up. And this is where they do the slalom racing, and this is where they do the freestyle. This is the path that goes down to the beach. So Frank was uh, an instrumental in getting the kayak races restarted. And oh yeah, and this is a map of the East Coast Greenways that comes through uh, Connecticut and through Terrafield. And this is my to-do list, which I never got to. <laughs> uh, so uh, our walking tour. Uh, I think maybe we've done enough. So uh, we won't bother with, with the rest of this. And that's basically it. And then we'll go and see some of this stuff. Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.